Supreme Court of California, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court sitting in bunk is now in session. Good morning. Welcome to Oral Argument, Supreme Court. Uh, before we call the calendar, I'd like to welcome morning visitors. We have students from UC Davis School of Law, the Appellate Advocacy class. Its professor is Shama Mesawala, also Chamber's attorney to Justice Ron Roby here at the Court of Appeal. Where are the students? Welcome. Glad you're here. And we also have students from Florin High School Law Academy with the advisor, Alana Matthews. Are you also here? Second two cases. Second two cases. Thank you, Frank. Clerk, we call the calendar. Thank you, Chief Justice. Supreme Court of California sitting in Sacramento on Wednesday morning, November 6, 2013 at 9 a.m., case number 196374, N. Ray Stephen Randall Glass on admission for objector Rachel Grunberg. Present, Your Honor. For applicant John B. Eisenberg. Ready. Case number 205876, Assessor for County of Santa Barbara, Plaintiff and Appellant versus Assessment Appeals Board Number 1, Defendant and Respondent, Rancho Galita Lakeside Mobileers, Inc. et al., Real Parties and Interests and Respondents. For Appellant, Marie A. Lasala. For Amicus Curie, James C. Harmon. For dependent, defendant and respondent, Jerry Zuliger. Ready. For real parties and interest and respondents, David C. Fainer, Jr. Ready. Case number 202210, Anne-Marie Donkin et al., plaintiffs and respondents, versus Rodney E. Donkin, Jr. et al., as trustees, etc. Defendants and appellants. For respondents, Mark H. Boykin. Ready, Honors. For appellants. Stephen L. Snow. Ready. Thank you, counsel. And in the first matter, in re Stephen Randall Blast, we have the Honorable Richard M. Moss, Associate Justice, Court of Appeal, Second Appellate District, Division 5, assigned in lieu of Justice Goodwin Liu, who is not participating. Counsel, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, my name is Rachel Grunberg. I represent the Committee of Bar Examiners for the State Bar of California, which strongly opposes Mr. Stephen Randall Glass's admission to the practice of law in California based on the rehabilitation record we have before us. Your Honors, this is not a case about a lapse in judgment, youthful indiscretion, or an isolated event. Mr. Glass is the perpetrator of one of the greatest frauds in American journalism history. Would you speak up a bit? Absolutely, Your Honor. I apologize. Mr. Glass is an infamous serial liar who, over the course of three years, fabricated 42 articles for major news publications. These are esteemed publications that were known for honest reporting and truthful journalism. Ms. Grunberg, let me ask you before we hear your further recitation of your view. What is the standard of review that this court is supposed to apply? We have the Committee of Bar Examiners wouldn't certify Mr. Glass. The State Bar Court found he did possess the requisite moral character. Um, and the Review Department of the State Bar, in a divided opinion, found that he had. Well, now here we are. What is the standard of review, and what are we reviewing? Well, Your Honor, that's, I think, a, a multi-level level question. Um, the way it works is these proceedings are sui generis. The Committee of Bar Examiners makes an initial determination based on moral character. It's a recommendation. 
it comes to this court as a recommendation. If the applicant is unhappy with that recommendation, they can petition to the state bar court where there's a more formal evidentiary hearing. And the state bar court also makes a recommendation. In this case, those recommendations are at odd, like, odds, like you just pointed out. In In Rain Mena, this court addressed that very issue. What happens when you have conflicting recommendations that come before this court? And in Mena, this court said, that both have come to this court bearing substantial weight within their spheres, but neither are binding on this court. This court exercises a de novo review. But Ms. Grunberg, aren't there principles that guide us, for example, stated in Henry Gossage that said, when an applicant applies for admission to the California State Bar, we draw reasonable inferences in favor of the applicant. However, when serious misconduct has been alleged, those positive inferences are more difficult to draw. And the more serious the misconduct, the greater evidence of rehabilitation is needed. Absolutely. Was the, that standard or those principles abided by by the State Bar Court in your in They the were not, Your Honor. We think the two most recent pronouncements by this court in In Re Mena and In Re Gossage stand for the principle that where you have serious or criminal misconduct involving proven acts of moral turpitude, that there's a heightened standard of rehabilitation that applies. But don't we usually defer to the trial courts who are able to observe the demeanor of witnesses? Your Honor, you, you can give substantial weight to the credibility determinations of the State Bar Court, but you don't have to. This court, but isn't it difficult for us here, not seeing the witnesses, to make a determination on credibility? That's true, but what you can do is review the evidence under a de novo standard and come to your own conclusions. In the abstract, we don't think you are bound by credibility determinations, but the reality is it's sort of a red herring in this case because we're not disputing the credibility findings of his character witnesses. Okay. That he's gotten people around him to believe that he's good and honest and a hard worker, we don't think is enough to carry the day in this case. If you had asked his colleagues, his coworkers, his So friends, even if we found that those witnesses were credible, you might still win. I think we should still win, Your Honor. <laughs> this court, the case law is abundantly clear that no matter how laudable, how credible, or how volum voluminous the number of character witnesses an applicant has, it doesn't carry the day with respect to rehabilitation. Why is moral character important to the profession of a lawyer? Your Honor, lawyers occupy a very unique place in our judicial system. We are officers of the court. And what does the name officer of the court imply? Is it your view that judges, by necessity, sometimes, oftentimes, have to rely on the words that uh, are uttered by a particular lawyer? Absolutely, Your Honor. Our profession is founded on the core principles of honesty, integrity, virtue, candor, respect for others. But again, why does it matter or why should it matter? It why matters shouldn't in... one just be lying about things and uh, take it from there? It matters because one of the Committee of Bar Examiner's primary purposes, as well as this court in the area of attorney admission and discipline, is public protection. Public confidence in the, in the profession and the integrity of the profession is the cornerstone of, of what it means to be a lawyer. Well, let's say we agree with you, but as I understand some of the testimony in his behalf, I believe, I mean, one of the witnesses, I think it was his present employer, but many others as well, said that he looks to him as the bedrock of integrity and honesty. Um, you're asking us or telling us that doesn't matter and we should, on what basis, conclude otherwise? Your Honor, character witnesses are one aspect of rehabilitation. If you all think right, about and it, what are the other aspects? It's a pie, if you think about it. There's all sorts of aspects. Mr. Glass says he, he, he has a job, he has a girlfriend, he says he has a sustained and fulfilling personal and professional life. He goes to therapy and he says he's sorry. So but that's part of the pie. It's part of the pie. And the character witnesses are part of the pie. Where does he lose in your view? He loses under the compelling 
the compelling showing of reformation that is required by this court. In In Re Mena and In Re Gossage, this court held that people with proven acts of moral turpitude are held to a higher standard of rehabilitation. And that's not just an unblemished record over a sustained period of time, but it includes exemplary conduct. And what this court said in Mena is that exemplary in conduct means going out and giving back to the community you harm. So is that the weak link in your in your mind? It's one of the weak links, yes, and we think a very strong weak link. Does There's it nothing on the, Does sorry. it make a difference whether the misconduct, uh, uh, let's assume that the misconduct is reprehensible. Does it make a difference whether that misconduct uh, has occurred as a pattern of conduct uh, over a long period of time as opposed to an isolated uh, instance where uh, someone uh, commits misconduct, clearly misconduct, but it is isolated. Absolutely, Honor. And what is really important to note is this, this scheme, this massive and deceptive scheme of public dishonesty occurred between 1995 and 1998. He enrolled in Georgetown Law School as a part-time student in 1997. So while he's endeavoring to become a member of this profession, he is enrolled in law school. He is learning about what it means to be a lawyer, the professional ethics that are required of this profession. His plight to become an attorney has been inextricably intertwined with his massive fraud, his lies, and his deceit. And we think that that's very important. How much can we, how much, how subatomic can we get here in terms of looking at his misconduct? There were allegations that he not only fabricated people in quotes, but events, and then created uh, sources and made up people and used his brother to be a source. And he uh, created use notes and created a a series, a depth of of deception that was pretty sophisticated. But it was all part of the misconduct. Are we able to be that subatomic in how we review the the misconduct in this case? Absolutely, Your Honor. You should review every aspect of the misconduct because it's in light of the misconduct that you are to evaluate the rehabilitation. You're going to hear in a few minutes that that's past misconduct and it's irrelevant to his present moral character. And we disagree. And we think the case law disagrees. It's After this misconduct, wasn't there also a book published? Yes, Your Honor. In 2003... So didn't he, in, a, in effect benefit from the misconduct continuously by receiving a, what, $175,000 retainer for the book? Absolutely, Your Honor. Mr. Glass wrote a fictionalized version of his misdeeds in a book called The Fabulist, which he began in 2001. And during all of this misconduct, he was being paid by the magazines? He was being paid by the magazines between 1995 and Did he repay any of that salary that he received? Absolutely not. Not a penny. He did not disgorge any of the profits that he made off his wrongdoing. And while it's not criminal or illegal to keep these proceeds, we think it's antithetical to the notion of moral reformation to profit off of your wrongdoings. Based on on his... Sorry. (laughs) Oh, go ahead, Justice Mosk. Based on his misconduct, uh, is he... uh, and the egregious nature of it, is he ever capable of being rehabilitated in your view, or is that something that we just have to wait till the future under your, your position? Your Honor, on this record, we don't think he should ever be admitted on this record. He has not met the compelling showing of overwhelming reform that we think is required by this court. He needs to go out and become a pillar of the community. He needs to change his perception. His name is so synonymous with being an infamous serial liar. So you're saying liar. that at some point, if he does all that, then you might reconsider. Is that The law in California is that any applicant, including applicants like Mr. Glass with extreme moral failures, can theoretically meet the standard of rehabilitation. That's the law that we have in California. But in a case like this, we think he needs to meet the compelling showing. It's a heightened showing. And on this record, he is woefully short. He has not met the truly exemplary conduct that's required. Is there a difference between the showing needed for admission to the bar as opposed to uh, readmission? After disbarment? 
In In Re Mena, that was a very similar take on this question. Um, Mr. Mena was a disbarred attorney, permanently disbarred in New Jersey, but he was a first-time applicant in California. And this court said, we're going to apply that heightened showing, that, that almost that reinstatement showing in that case, because he had proven acts of moral turpitude in another area. And so he had to meet that heightened showing. And so we think that this is a similar case. Well, at the outset, as I'm reading what's in front of me, the review department said uh, that Mr. Glass's um, burden of proof as a first-time applicant was, quote, substantially less rigorous than were it an attorney seeking reinstatement. Um, and the policy of the state favors admission of applicants who have achieved reformation. So the review department that favored uh, Mr. Glass's admission seems to have relied on that standard. Mm -hmm. And are you telling us that's not the standard? We don't think they applied the true standard that was applied most recently by this court in In Re Mena and In Re Gossage. In Re Mena was a disbarred attorney from another state, but Mr. Gossage was not. And this court still applied that compelling standard test. And in fact, in footnote 21 in Gossage, this court left open the question about whether or not all applicants with proven moral turpitude issues must meet this compelling standard. And instead, this court said that case law already allows for the common sense notion that it's a balancing test and that the higher the misconduct, the higher the level of rehabilitation. And in the Gossage case, even though you didn't have the reinstatement aspect, he already was at that highest level of misconduct. In urging us to agree with you, that uh, here the applicant for state bar admission should not be admitted. I just need some clarification from you. Um, number one, what is the time period that, from your perspective, we'll later hear from the other side, that from your perspective is important here? Do we go back to 1998 when Glass started fabricating material for the New Republic? Was it at that time that he began making up quotations from unnamed sources, later wrote articles that were fabricated from start to finish? Is that a correct reflection of the record? Well, he actually, his first article, his first fabricated article was written in 1995, but not published until 1996. So he was engaged in a three-year pattern of authoring over 40 Did he write an article that talked about... Uh, African Americans in the United States being unwilling to take on any menial employment. And according to the article, these conversations were based on talks with, I think, a taxi cab driver, a limo <coughs> driver, um, and I thought a criminal. And as it turned out, none of these persons existed. Certainly not for the sources of the article. Was there also an article where the applicant talked about young conservative Republicans giving up politics and turning to sex and drugs and luring young unattractive women into hotel rooms and get them to undress? Uh, was there an incident that was completely fabricated, at least according to my recollection of the record, where he blamed a uh, customer service representative of some company to have made a racial slur? And uh, is it correct to say that the applicant then wrote to the president of this particular uh, company complaining about this racial slur? and um, then sent a copy to the Anti-Defamation League. The slur, as I gather from the record, was never uttered. And I think you may have mentioned at the outset that uh, a total of 42 articles by the applicant were published by the New Republic. Is that correct? And was there another incident where, uh, I think it was in 1998, well, Charles Lane, the editor of the New Republic, received information that certain facts 
in an article that the applicant had written for George magazine called Hack Heaven, uh, which told of a teenager uh, who alleg alleg allegedly hacked a California so software company. Uh, that these facts have no semblance to the truth. Lane, the editor, then questioned Glass and perhaps you uh, remember the details of uh, what occurred then, that the applicant, in being confronted by Glass, tried to cover up the fabrications by creating an imaginary reporter's notes and a phony website. And did he persuade his brother to impersonate somebody else in a conversation with Lane? And according to the article, the convention took place in a certain building uh, in Maryland. When Lane checked out the facts, it turned out that this convention was never held in that particular building. Then it appears that the applicant when the editor tried to fire him, the applicant was quite persuasive in getting very influential and powerful people to go his way. And it was Lane who had to fight for his job. Uh, is that a correct reflection of the record? Absolutely, Your Honor. You, you are very familiar with this record. That's exactly what happened. Mr. Glass engaged in a very sophisticated and complex scheme of deception, a very public scheme of deception. Over three years, he fabricated 42 articles. And these weren't just lies in the articles. He but then one could say, so what? You know, people are expected to lie. Perhaps if we were to agree uh, with the other side and disagree with you, um, would there be any harm in the court making up things in opinions? Or would the attorneys have problems with that? I mean, where do we draw the line? Your Honor, if Mr. Glass was to fabricate evidence, lie to this court, lie in his pleadings and in declarations, and betray the trusts and confidences of his clients, the harm in the legal profession to the profession would be immeasurable. I absolutely agree with you. I'm looking at uh, that if that were the case, it would be. Yes. Um, I'm looking again at Gossage. When the prior acts of moral turpitude are very serious, I don't think even opposing counsel is going to question that these were very serious in a way that's the crux of the uh, integrity you want in the legal profession. When that's the case, we must be convinced that the applicant is no longer the same person who behaved so poorly in the past and will find moral fitness, quote, only if he has since behaved in an exemplary fashion over a meaningful period of time. And I think Justice Mosk raised the question, can, in your view, could this person ever rehabilitate himself? I anticipate that opposing counsel is going to say that standard has been met. He has. Uh, behaved in an exemplary fashion over a meaningful period of time. So anticipating that argument, what would you say in response? Well, one, we don't think he's met the truly exemplary part of that test, which means going back to the community and aiding the community that he So harmed. you feel he has not? He has not done that part of the test. He has not gone out and done charitable endeavors. He should be going around and lecturing and speaking to journalism students. I thought he actually did. If Did I mistake something that I read he that he actually did limited, speak to classes? He had three limited speaking engagements in 2003, all about the time his book came out. It's the same time he aired his um, 60 Minutes episode aired. Can you speak to the testimony at the hearing for the state bar where it appeared to me on the, re on the record that it could be argued very persuasively that the applicant had failed to come completely clean with all the articles that had harmed people and or his efforts to assist the newspapers in clarifying the record and putting it straight? You're absolutely right, Your Honor. There, if we're talking about an unblemished period of time, we think there are several several gaps in this 
this, this period of time we're going to look at. And one is that it took him until 2009, that's 11 years after he was outed as a fraud, to actually sit down and put together a comprehensive list of all of his articles. Now, why did he do it in 2009? Not because it was the right thing to do, not because it was going to aid the magazines or assist his victims. He did it because the Committee of Bar Examiners of the State Bar of California asked that he put together this list in connection with these moral character proceedings. That list was to benefit him in his plight to gain admission to the bar and not for altruistic purposes, to give back to the community. That's the truly exemplary conduct we're talking about that's missing here. When you say giving back to the community and speaking, he's entitled to earn a living, isn't he? Absolutely, Your Honor. And, and, I mean, does he have to do what Profumo did and clean toilets in a, in a charity on the East End? I mean, what, what, no, Your what, Honor. what, are, what are the deficiencies exactly? I mean, what consistent with his having to earn a living? It's, it's not just the money. I mean, there maybe have been, been a period of time that he didn't make a living and he profited off of his wrongdoings. But he is a man of means at this point. He makes, the record shows, over $150,000 as a law clerk. But he couldn't do that if he was out doing what you want him to do. He could donate some of his money to charitable endeavors. He absolutely could. He also could donate his time. He could go out and give speeches and lectures. You know what he could do is put together a memoir of the actual events about what actually happened. Instead, what we have is a book in 2003 called The Fabulist, which is a fictionalized novel. It's not truthful. It's a, fic it's a novel One that he wrote. One a uh, professor of journalism or a professor of law without a law degree. Isn't that correct? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. One can serve as a professor of law. Absolutely, yes. Or a professor at a uh, journalism school without admission to the bar. Absolutely, absolutely, Your Honor. And he, he has given some speeches where he was invited. Um, George Washington College invited him to come speak in 2003. And the, the professor that set it up there said it was very valuable to have him there. He fielded questions, and the journalism students benefited from having him there, from learning from him about how not to go down the errant pathway that he did, about how to <coughs> learn about profess professional ethics and judgment. With being a journalist and with being a lawyer, why would integrity be important to either profession? It just is, Your Honor. It's a cornerstone of the profession, without which, you know, our, our position as lawyers is almost valueless. That, we, we are officers of the court, fiduciaries. We aid in the administration of justice. We promote justice. We have a very well, unique... Well, those are very nice-sounding words, of course. I agree with you. But in practice... Does it really matter? It absolutely matters. That one matters. has integrity? It absolutely matters. It not only matters to... Just take a look at journalism. Why does integrity matter there? Is it because thousands and thousands and thousands of readers just read what has been written by the journalist and trust that what has been said or written is the truth? Absolutely. And why would there be any damage if the facts are made up? It, it caused immeasurable damage to the journalism profession. He denigrated an entire profession with his lies and deceit. Well, isn't it also true, as alleged and argued, that many of these articles also impugn real people? Um, uh, the Vernon Jordan article, things that really cut to uh, racial divides in the United States and to people and public figures that I understand were, were lies. Absolutely, Your Honor. He, he talked about real people, real organizations, and he maligned them and spoke about them in a way that cast aspersions on all of them, in a way that, that <coughs> indelibly marked forever in print and out there in the public domain for everyone to read. And As I understand it, uh, the record indicates that there was an attempt to be admitted to the uh, bar in New York, correct? Absolutely. And not. that was uh, rebuffed. And 
it's my recollection that were there were misrepresentations made in that application? Absolutely, Your Honor. He applied to the New York Bar in 2002, and he withdrew his application in 2004 when he learned that an adverse moral character decision was imminent. And in 2002, the New York Bar asked him about the level of assistance that he gave to the magazines, and he represented that he assisted all of the magazines in identifying all of his fabricated articles. Well, we know that's not true for several reasons. He initially worked with TNR, the New Republic, through his counsel. But it was the magazine that had to come up with the list. They had, they're the ones that painstakingly had to go through line by line and article by article to try to come up with a list. They would show it to applicants' counsel, and applicant would say yes or no, and that was it. They, he basically left it to the magazine to do all the laborious work. And in fact, to this day, there are eight articles the magazine was not able to identify. And then the other magazines, the other four magazines, he asked his counsel to work with them, but then never followed up to see if his counsel actually had worked with them. And going back to my original question about giving deference to the trial court that hears the testimony, is there any dispute in the record regarding these misrepresentations? You know, it's interesting. The State Bar Court actually said these were mischaracterizations. They said they were mischaracterizations, but they declined to give any weight in aggravation to them. We don't really understand why, but I don't think there's any dispute in the record that these were misrepresentations, and at a time when he should have been scrupulously honest, at a time when he's trying to show rehabilitation from these bad acts, these 42 fabricated articles, and if you think of them each as individual bad acts, he should have been... I want, to, I want to say almost, he almost had a heightened duty to be more acu accurate, more forthcoming. Ms. Grenberg, yes. I want to interrupt you. You'll have two minutes for rebuttal. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, Your Honors. John Eisenberg for Stephen Glass. May it please the court. Mr. Eisenberg. Yes. As an officer of the court, should we believe Whatever you tell the court. You must have faith. In Is my that integrity. the best you can come up with? You must. Should, <laughs> should you believe everything I say? I certainly would hope so. You have to believe me. Of course. Uh, if I mislead this court, that is a very serious transgression. Well, isn't that a major concern here then, Mr. Eisenberg? As uh, the State Bar pointed out earlier, someone who gets admitted to the California Bar becomes an officer of the court, and as uh, indicated earlier when uh, the question was posed, as an officer of the court, as you have acknowledged, it is important that one's utterances to the court have integrity because a judge, by necessity, would sometimes have to rely on the utterances of a particular officer of the court. Here, the State Bar has argued to this court that based upon this record, the applicant shouldn't be admitted. And presumably, there's a concern by the State Bar that if a admitted to the bar, no one would, could ever be sure that uh, the applicant would act in an honest manner with the court, with the attorneys, or with the client. The issue before this court today is does Stephen Glass have integrity now? There is no doubt that he did some terrible things from 1996 to 1998. No doubt whatsoever. The Stephen Glass of those years should not have been admitted to the practice of law in California. The question is whether in the 15 years since then he has rehabilitated himself. Uh, could he ever, could one ever rehabilitate himself from the sort of misconduct this man uh, engaged in 15 to 17 years ago? I think the law tells us yes. 
The and law of the state of California believes... And what is the rehabilitation based on? I'm sorry, Your Honor. What is the rehabilitation based on? He has worked hard, worked successfully, worked well as a lawyer. He has impressed everybody as he a has worked with. As a, forgive me, Your Honor, as a law clerk. As a law clerk. Forgive me. A law clerk in a law office. I misspoke. He has not worked as a lawyer. He has been employed as a law clerk and paralegal. He has impressed everybody he has worked with. They all, they he impressed all lots of people at the New Republic. He did indeed. The question is, Mr. Has Edward, he let me ask you this. We, we take you and the, and the esteemed members of the bar who are your colleagues at their word yes. when they tell us something. Yes. In part because of the reputation that each of you has earned and brings with you when you appear before a judge. Right? Yes. And when a judge learns that a lawyer has lied about something important, that's a big uh, speed bump to overcome in the future. It Isn't takes so? a long time to regain a sullied reputation. No and, doubt about it. This, is say, it possible? That's the question. Is it possible? Redemption is a wonderful thing. Is it possible? Is it? Yeah, of course. The, it's law, the law says it's possible. The law says it's possible, and we should acknowledge that precedent. Yes. Here's my problem. They say that character is what you do when no one's looking. Mr. Glass's uh, history of performance when no one was looking has been pretty abysmal. Yes. And I think what you what the court really needs to hear is what he ha he has done. What's his best pitch for showing that that abysmal history going to the essence of his integrity has been? What was he doing between 2004 and now? What has he been doing? He has not been under scrutiny all that time. So I used 2004 because that's when he came to California. That's when Stephen Glass did what so many of us have done, or our parents or, gra or grandparents. He came to California to make a new life for himself, to get a fresh start. And he started at the bottom, getting a job, making a life for himself here, and nobody was watching, nobody at all. Well, let me, did let me, a really let me ask good you that, Mr. Eisenberg. Yes. In the nine years since he was rebuffed by the New York uh, bar examiners uh, to the present, nine years, I mean, it, it, the argument could be made, a uh, reasonable inference could be made, that um, Mr. Glass knew he would be applying for the California bar, knew he would need new character references, and knew he would need uh, more recent character references in California. So those nine years, in, in many ways, were still... Um, in the fishbowl, so to speak. I mean, that argument <coughs> certainly could be made here in terms of thinking about the grand scheme that certainly informed his conduct from 96 to 98, could it not? That would be an argument that effectively Mr. Glass can never rehabilitate himself because everything he ever does will be designed to achieve something uh, dishonest. That's the argument that what he did 15 be, years but, ago is But if we look at the history of his misconduct, it's not an unreasonable inference, is it not, from his past conduct and the planning and the sophistication for those of us in California to hear that argument and consider it reasonably persuasive? Is it not an equally reasonable inference that he really is rehabilitating himself, that this is not all just a, a grand scheme to defraud a, uh, lawyer's client in Well, California. Mr. Eisenberg, uh, opposing counsel made reference to the slices of the pie. Mm -hmm. And uh, one part of the pie that I think uh, the counsel mentioned is giving back to the community, uh, devoting himself to speaking about ethics to journalism uh, students and so forth. So let's assume that, yes, he got a job and he's performed very well in his work. He's a very, very bright person. But what about this redemption, not just successful in what you've chosen to do, but finding redemption by giving back in a very particular way to uh, make up for the very particular way in which you were morally uh, wrong? 
The, state, the Committee of Bar Examiners has argued that the way for him to give back is to give money. Well, let's say we don't have That's to agree with that. But how about just undertaking a crusade through books and appearances and lectures and, uh, and adjunct professorships to tell the tale of, of moral failure and moral redemption? How do you make a living? How do you work? Stephen Glass works 10 hours a day, six days a week. You I know, happen to know Mr. This. Eisenberg. There's there not a lot of time for public speaking about how bad he was 15 years ago. Well, he the wrote man a book. has to make a He wrote a book. He had time he wrote to a book before he, he had time a time for job. television to appear. Excuse me, he Mr. Eisenberg. A... He wrote a book. He had time for that. And uh, he, I'm told, I have not seen it, it has appeared on television and what have you. So there is time. He wrote the book before he had a job. Right, he wrote Eisenberg, the book in 2002 and 3. He began you working. He became an adult in 2004 when he began to work in the real world, working for real people, holding down a real job, and learning what it's like to be a man. Mr. Eisenberg, may I ask you a question? Yes. Thank you. Of course. Um, there are many people in American life who do wonderful good works who make substantially less than $150,000 a year and do those good works on the weekends and at night and at lots of other uh, times. They manage to earn a living. They manage to go to work. Um, so I'm having a little trouble with the argument that, you, that he couldn't go out and do good works because after all he has to make a living. Lots of people do good works who are also making a living. I don't believe the record indicates that he's been making $150,000 a year for the past 10 years. Well, we have the record for of any years. amount of time. He made $90,000 the previous year, then he made one hundred and fifty. I don't even know what he makes. I don't know what he made. There's no evidence in the record. Well, let's get back to say, if I might, Justice Carter. Certainly. Um, all right, so there's some disagreement whether... Yep. Um, so in your view, what demonstrates rehabilitation in the core issue that we are concerned about, as Justice Kennard has emphasized so much? I think that it's a difficult thing for us to determine whether or not, and I mean by us, this court, these attorneys, for us to pass judgment on his rehabilitation without having known the man and seen him for But years. we have to. But we have help. We have help from the people who have known him, who have worked with him. <coughs> People he, he victimized. We have help from all of them. We have 22 of them who testified as to his good moral character. They, I believe, are the best judge of his character. Not even he himself. His testimony is very interesting. It's worth paying a great deal of attention to because I think his own testimony is compelling. But the ones who are going to be the most helpful to this court are the people he has worked with, the professors he's studied under, his colleagues, his psychiatrists, Boy, the these people who know this man. Psychiatrists, I mean, they're not, they're his psychiatrists, yes. he pays them. They're not independent, like we that have in parole correct. hearings. I mean, you know, they're not an independent evaluator, are they? No, but they are also not, I think we can safely assume they are not uh, going to commit perjury on his behalf. They have testified he is not a sociopath. He is not a, psycho a pathological liar. They were not treating him for pathological lying. Is that the standard we're going to adopt? You of course not. You have to be made a part of the bar if you're not a pathological liar and a of sociopath? Of course not. But the state bar, the committee has taken the position, I believe this is how Ms. Grunberg opened her argument. This man is a liar. This man is a liar. Well, I think there's not a lot of dispute about that. No, this man was a liar. The question is not whether he was a liar 15 years ago. We know he was. The question is, is he a liar today? And the record demonstrates as well as any record could ever demonstrate that he is not a liar today. What we have heard from the State Bar is, quote, from Ms. Grumberg, on this record, he should never be admitted. And of course, that's not our issue, whether he should ever be admitted. But she may have said that. That's our uh, argument. But that's not the issue before us. The that issue is, is correct. To, excuse me, Mr. Eisenberg. The issue before us today is, should he today be admitted? I just want to clarify that. Of course. The issue today is, 
does he have integrity today? Does and he have are we good persuaded of moral that? Good moral character today. Was and he in a position to, to, what position was he in where he could tell the truth or not tell the truth? I mean, he, if a law clerk, he's not presumably dealing with the public. Uh, uh, how would he have the capacity or the exposure to telling the truth or not telling the truth? How would we, uh, how do we get that out of what he's been doing? I think it's probably possible to determine whether somebody is capable of telling the truth without that person being a lawyer. The question is how, and how they live their lives day to day. How they, uh, the impact, the effect they have on the people around them. Uh, Stephen Glass has made friends who have such trust in him that they have asked him to be the godfather to their children. That is somebody who has learned to have faith in this man. Mr. Eisenberg, it seems to me that the test of truth is not only being honest with your friends, but being honest with your enemies, or being honest with people who necessarily aren't big fans of yours. Yes. And I am troubled to a certain extent by the testimony that I read in the hearing at the state bar where it came as a, quite a surprise to Mr. Lane, who was tasked with determining the fabrications of the New Republic, that there were four articles on his tendered list to uh, Mr. Glass and his attorneys that he thought were fabrications, that Mr. Uh, Glass denied were fabrications. And then later, at the California State Bar hearing, it determined that, yes, those four articles that Mr. Lane had previously identified as fabricated turned out to be fabricated. And also, there were four more that Mr. Lane didn't even know about that Mr. Glass admitted to in the California Bar hearing. So when we talk about coming clean, I am troubled. Could you explain that? Yes. Think back to 1998, when Stephen Glass's entire life came <clears throat> justifiably crashing down upon him. His, his world was destroyed. He was distraught. He was suicidal. Didn't he blame his parents for no, he putting pressure on him to excel in school? He did not. He testified, I was under a lot of pressure from my parents, but I take possession. I take responsibility for what I became. He did not blame his parents. It's been pitched that way in the press, but if you read the record, you will see it is not true. He said, I take ownership of what I did, me. I did it, and I'm responsible. Mr. Eisenberg, you mentioned that we should place a great deal of weight on the law professors that were teaching him. Did any of them teach him while he was perpetrating this fraud? I don't believe so. So those professors who testified, testified, taught him after? Yes, sure. But there was some period of time after 98 that he continued to not take responsibility for this fraud. That is, not helping New Republic determine which were fabrications and which were not. Is that, that, is, that, that, is that, is that correct? A, no, it is not correct. He did work with the New Republic in a very constrained environment where he uh, questions were but posed But he didn't to sit him. down with the New Republic editors and say, okay, you caught me. This is what I did. He, he hired a, a lawyer. He was a wreck. It, it, try if you can. I don't think it's possible. I can't do it. But I can begin to imagine a little bit of what this man's life was like when everything came crashing down upon him. He was held up to public ridicule. His career was destroyed. He was suicidal. I can understand that the man would not be perfectly capable of sitting down and calmly identifying all the horrible things that he did. The, the difficult thing with being a liar, with being a, a, a persistent liar, it's not so easy to remember all your lies. It's very stressful, if I might say it's so. It's very, very <laughs> stressful. You know, I would, I would yes, like to is. make a distinction he, he here. Had a, he had a lot to overcome. I, you know, I think we all can accept that, truly. Uh, but I'd like to make a distinction here between compassion for a human being who has suffered, and I don't think we're going to take issue with that, and his world came crashing down upon him. That's a given. Yes. We factor that in, but our responsibility, after all, being admitted to practice law is a privilege. There are many other professions an individual can pursue where you don't have this kind of review. So just to get us back on track, if I might, because I think we can accept that this was very sad and very stressful. But our task is to certify that his moral character is such today. 
that he can, with integrity, be a member of the board. And uh, going back to can he ever or should he now, there is a timeline, and some members of the bench have pointed out, well, how long actually, forget about he was so stressed he couldn't tell all the articles that he had uh, fabricated. But there's a timeline. So his timeline of rehabilitation, what would you say is? I would say 15 years from 1998. Uh, there was some dispute about that. I think indisputably 11 years from 2002, indisputably. There is some argument about the 2002 application to the New York State Bar. I believe he testified that the inaccuracies on that application were inadvertencies. The State Bar judge believed that testimony. That uh, credibility determination is entitled, I believe, to substantial deference. But even giving the conflicting evidence of those first few years, the conflicting evidence about 2003, 2002, when he applied to the State Bar, there's no conflict as to what happened since then. I think that, at the very least, he's got an 11-year rehabilitation period. And the, the rehabilitation, present. just to repeat so I'm clear, is that he has held a job and he is held in esteem by the persons that know him today. You no, know, it is more than that. All right. He has developed a reputation among other lawyers and judges that he's worked for, for impeccable honesty. Impeccable honesty. He learned very bitterly the wages of being a liar to the extent that he had been. He learned that in order to rehabilitate himself, to reform himself, he had to be utterly and completely honest about everything, even to the point of something so trivial as when he was given too much change from his store clerk and driving away and realizing it, turning his car around, driving back and giving the change back. That is trivial. Two but factors that the uh, State Bar <coughs> has uh, listed in terms of rehabilitation are restitution, mm -hmm. and the first question is, has he ever at least offered to uh, provide money back to anybody who's been damaged, including the people uh, uh, mentioned in the articles and his salary and so forth? And secondly, they say a significant and conscientious involvement in community, church, or privately sponsored programs designed to provide social benefits or to ameliorate social problems. I think that's what the uh, Council for the State Bar was, was getting at. So those two items, I wondered if you could say whether or not he's complied with either of those or both. He offered to pay back his salary to Martin Peretz, who was the editor and, and, as he put it, the sole loss payer of the New Republic. Is that his director? A number of years later. That is the man who ran the show at the New Republic. He's Mr. The man Perez who is the one who accused the bar of being a stalker for uh, investigating Mr. Glass. Is that right? Mr. Peretz, Mr. Peretz was very unimpressed, shall we say, with the... the, the zeal with which the state bar has gone after Mr. Glass. He is a very colorful... That's one way to characterize Yes, he is a very colorful witness. But the question is, did he offer to pay the money back? And the answer is yes. What about to the victims, to Burden Jordan or to uh, the, the victims? Of he wrote letters of apology to all of them. My question to the state, to the committee is, what money is there to be paid back to them? Would the committee have him give $10,000? Well, we have defamation $10, actions, you know, what? where people collect money. And Mr. Jordan could have sued. Nobody had one person sued, and they got money. But this wasn't about money. It was about damage to reputation. Money does not rehabilitate one's reputation. The way to rehabilitate the reputation of one who's, who you impugned is to state publicly that you lied. Well, and to write to that person and apologize. One of the factors, as I mentioned, was restitution. The other one was significant conscientious involvement in community, church, or privately sponsored programs designed to provide social benefits or to ameliorate social problems. Is there any of that? There has been some, but not since he began working quite much more than full time in his law firm. When he was in New York and Washington, there was some of that. 
when he came out to California, he put himself to the task of making a career for himself as best he could, uh, within the context also of very heavy psychotherapy, which requires a lot of money. It's not cheap seeing a psychiatrist once or twice a week. Well, I I would, uh, hypothetically, for purposes of this morning, grant you that money, it's not all about money. Mm -hmm. And letters of apology and so forth might factor in. With respect to recompense, other than money, uh, would you tell us what your client has done? He's changed himself. Now, what's more important than that? I didn't hear that response. I'm sorry. He has changed himself. All right. He has, making amends, I think, more than anything else means amending yourself. It's easy to say I'm sorry. If you've got the money, it's relatively easy to give money. I have no doubt that if Mr. Glass had given $150,000 to the Columbia School Actually, of as my question suggested, I'm not really focusing on money or no money. Yes. I'm looking to other uh, ways of, of showing uh, remorse and having redemption. And you started by telling me. He's changed himself, but we have to look at um, the ways that's demonstrated that are pertinent to the question. Um, and might I, uh, just as an example, uh, throw out an analogy of some of the lawyers that were involved in the Watergate cover-up, who from that time on, after prison time, etc., devoted their lives to the ministry and to public good. Stephen Glass. And frankly, I think in their case, they were covering up activities of others as opposed to covering up one's own activities. They had committed crimes. That is certainly too true. They had committed crimes. I think criminals are in a different realm entirely. What Stephen Glass did uh, without committing a crime is about as bad as they can get without being a criminal but he was not a criminal. I think what he did is something capable of being redeemed over time. And my question was, uh, again, I want you to have this opportunity, besides saying he's reformed himself, which isn't is, of course, most... fundamental, but how? what else? Isn't that the most important thing? Well, our standard is exemplary fashion, and so I'm also curious to hear your factors that indicate that Mr. Glass has behaved in an exemplary fashion. I realize he's changed himself. I realize that he works hard and and the people around him are impressed. But I bet I could say that for 90% of the people in this room. But it's a different case for us, given the backdrop of misconduct. So I'd really like to hear your full response to Justice Rutherford. The best I can give you is this. It's not easy to change yourself. It's really not easy. Losing weight alone is difficult, a physical change. Mr. To Eisenhower, change. we are all human, yes. and we all know that. Yes. We all have struggled with whatever we've struggled with. Yes. I think what the court is asking you, and if you don't have anything to offer, that's not your fault. But what if, it, so he came to California, and he worked hard, and he got a good job, and he wrote a book, and he went to therapy. All of that is wonderful. And I will take you at your word, sir, Mm -hmm. because that's what we do here in the law, that he has um, improved himself in the judgment of himself and his psychotherapists. Objectively, behaviorally, beyond what you have alluded to, is there any other behavior on his part that you would like to bring to the court's attention? I can only tell you this. He has shown genuine remorse. He has worked over 10 years in intensive therapy to deal with why he did what he did and to make himself into a better person. He worked hard. He worked diligently. He worked honestly. He made a stable and fulfilling personal life for himself here in California and he committed himself to rehabilitation. Do you know if he... I think that's a lot. If he'd had done this, if he'd been admitted to the bar and then decided to go into journalism and then done what he did, would he be disbarred? Is that a disbarred? If he'd done what he'd done, certainly wasn't a crime. That's an interesting question. I do not know the answer to that. To lie in a... uh, Let's say a lawyer today lies on a blog. 
Would that be a disbarable offense? I, do, I have no idea, but I suspect maybe not. You have, argued, well today. you have argued, Mr. Eisenberg, that uh, your client um, has reformed himself. Question to you, has he done any volunteer work? Mm, yes, he has, in his capacity, as a law clerk at his firm, he has done a great deal of pro, pro bono work Did off the law hours. firm off pay? Hours. Thank you. <laughs> Did the law firm pay him for the pro bono work? They paid him a salary. They didn't pay him to work 10 hours a day, six or seven days a week. They paid him a salary. I mean, I do a lot of And what kind of pro bono work? Would you just give some examples other than telling the court your client has reformed himself? Uh, he's, um, I know he's done some work with homeless shelters. I know that he has uh, done some work with uh, indigent people. Um, In connection with, with his association with the law firm? Yes, on, on cases that the court that the firm has done pro bono. He okay, has so worked the firm, on their pro bono cases. Okay, so the firm has taken cases, pro bono, and he's worked on them. Off hours. Well, most lawyers work off hours at some point or another. Has and he gone to the shelter and, I, and served food to the homeless? I, I, I do not done? know, but, but I'll tell you, when you I work... You don't know? I do not know. All right. When I work off hours, I consider it pro bono work. If I go home tonight and it's been four hours working on a public interest case, I consider that pro bono. I'm not watching TV. I'm not taking a walk. I'm working. And I do it a lot. And I consider that pro bono work. And I consider what I do. I really do. When I'm and I'm pleased for you, Mr. Eisenberg. I'm just he, trying to figure out what Mr. Glass has he done. He has done the same thing. He has worked on pro bono cases at his firm off hours. Above and beyond the 9 to 5 or 8 to 6 or 7 to 7 that many of us lawyers work. He works 9 to 10. But many people put in far more than the regular 9 to 5 hours. And I was delighted to hear from you. Anything you put in after the work schedule ends at 5 o'clock is pro bono work. For the members of this court, that's a lot of pro bono work. <laughs> I think that's true. I do. I think the members of this court devote above and beyond what is to be expected from most of us. And you're and I talking consider, as an officer of the court. I consider what this court does to be uh, each justice in this court above and beyond, truly. And I think Stephen Glass has worked above and beyond. I see I have 26 seconds left. I would only like to say this in closing. Uh, we are asking you to have faith in Stephen Glass, faith in the in the notion that he has redeemed himself, but it is not blind faith we are asking you to have. You have a record. You have 22 character witnesses, and you have testimony from this man whom the State Bar judge believed. It is not blind faith. There is something you can stand on to determine with confidence that he has redeemed himself and he has good moral, moral character, the moral character required for him to practice law in this state. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eisenberg. I've put in a lot of pro bono work on this case myself. Um, Why shouldn't we agree with Mr. Eisenberg's last statement sure. that his client has reformed himself and the members of this court should have faith in that? They should not have faith, Your Honor. It is his burden to show by clear and convincing evidence, overwhelming proof of clear and convincing evidence, that he has met the high standard of rehabilitation that is required of this court. This court has said that we need a record that we can lay before the world with confidence before installing someone like Mr. Glass in the profession, and that actions speak louder than words. Now, you mentioned overwhelming proof by clear and convincing evidence. Is that a standard from some case? 
The clear and convincing standard is the standard that applies in all moral character cases. It's I thought the there was something about reasonable inferences favor the applicant. Your Honor, that's as when you're weighing individual pieces of evidence in a case, if you have a piece of evidence from which equally reasonable inferences can be drawn, we think that negative inferences should be more easily drawn. Not positive inferences, like the State Bar Court did. They did give him the benefit of the doubt every time he had an excused or justification for why something was incomplete, ill-timed, or misunderstood. Let me take you back to your clear and convincing evidence. Uh, I interrupted you, so please proceed. So we, it's his burden to prove overwhelming reformation by clear and convincing evidence. And everything we've heard today is that, by all accounts, he's acting like a model citizen. But that's something that's expected of me and you and everybody in this court. Well, just to wrap up, what else could he do in your judgment or the judgment of the review department? He could go out and be an exemplar. He could go out and be... He could go out and do charitable endeavors. He should be a pillar of the community. He should lead by example. He should go out, and whether it's with time Does one money, have to be a pillar of the community yes. in order to be redeemed? No. He needs to show the exemplary conduct. That means giving back to the community he harmed. It means actions. It means tangible, affirmative, outward evidence of good deeds, that he's giving back to those he's harmed, and we don't have that on this record. And I'll leave you with this. As Mr. Glass testified himself in his New York bar proceedings, what I did was such a severe breach of the journalism rules. I will never be welcome within journalism, and rightly so. The New York bar has said that they don't want him as a member of their esteemed profession. Well, that was many years ago. It was in 2004, and he applied for admission in 2007, three years later. What has he done to prove to the state of California, to the committee of bar examiners, and to you, that he is reformed by compelling evidence in order to be installed in this profession? And we submit that he is not. Do we look at the time that he's, uh, we only look at the time that he's applied and no acts thereafter. We're only judging him at the time of the application. Well, the committee is going off of, uh, off of the, the most recent statement in Ray Gossett, which is you look from the last bad act until the time they file their moral character application, because once they're under the scrutiny of the state bar, they're expected to perform on the And when was the moral application? 2007, Your Honor. So we, from 2007 to 2014, we ignore that, correct? No, it's just not entitled to the same amount of weight as unsupervised misconduct, because What's a truer sense, of, uh, a truer indication of rehabilitation is when the person is doing it for altruistic purposes and not because they're trying to gain admission to the bar. Everything in this case are things that benefit Mr. Glass at times that they benefit Mr. Glass. They inure to his own benefit. We have not seen that community outreach, that <coughs> effort to reach out to the community he's harmed. Ms. Grunberg, your time's expired. I thank you very much. Thank you. Counsel, the matter is submitted.